going live. You're live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop and today we have the great Anne of all trades. <laughs> I wouldn't those... call me great, but hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or those in the, uh, the chat say uh, Queen Anne from the land of goats. <laughs> oh, I was going to say Queen Anne of Green Tables, maybe. <laughs> yes. So uh, for those of you who don't know, we have a bit of a, a running gag on the channel of the, 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 the Knights of the White Oak. Uh, so there's a bit of a, a medieval fun going on in here. <laughs> At least it's not the Knights of the Red Oak, because I'd have to leave right now. <laughs> yes. No, that's his father's kingdom. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, Yeah. Everything in their house is Red Oak. Well, actually, I can't really say anything because I'm literally sitting in a chair that's made of red oak as we speak, but <laughs> I hit it with Polly. So uh, for those of you uh, new to the channel, this is a live we do every Tuesday. About once a month, we do an interview with some other creator on YouTube. And so we've got a, a few others lined up, but this month it is Anne of all trades. And uh, we are going to be interviewing her, seeing what she's up to and uh, what uh, what's her uh, background all about and some of the pros and cons and differences between channels. Um, and we're also going to be then um, um, doing Q, uh, uh, questions. So after we do a little talk through here, um, we'll be going through whatever questions you have. So throw those down in the chat. If you're watching this recorded, um, all of the questions have a timestamp on them. So you can see that down in the, the scroll below or you can look down in the, in the description and read through all the questions and jump to uh, a question if you want to see that. So, uh, You're so official. I'm going to have to learn how to do this stuff from you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking, it's uh, now been almost, well, it's been three years since I've been doing the lives and two years since Sarah's been here with them. So it's been a, a decent little run with it. I love it. So um, we have Anne here. And uh, Sarah, budge in if anything comes up you need me to. Oh, don't worry. I'll throw the duck at you. <laughs> <laughs> so Anne, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do and uh, what got you into what you're doing? All right. Well, I'm Anne and I am a woodworker. Uh, although right now I'm kind of not, I can't really call myself a woodworker at this exact moment because uh, two years ago now we packed up our entire lives. We had a small urban farm in Seattle and we moved across the country to Nashville, Tennessee, where I had dreams of starting a much bigger farm and also launching a craft school where we could teach disappearing life skills to people um from all over the world and all over the world so we're going to be doing um eventually when the craft school gets built we will be doing um live in-person classes and also doing online courses as well in hand tool woodworking blacksmithing welding and fabrication um like cooking canning homesteading skills like all of the things uh, basically that you could have learned in the 1700s as part of your daily life will now be uh, taught at the School of All Trades. Really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, so how's, how's the, uh, the building coming? Uh, well, much, much, much slower than we would have uh, liked had we the opportunity to uh, see the future and what COVID-19 would do to the six month building project that has now been carrying on for a year and a half. Uh, but yeah, it's it's coming along. Um, for those of you that don't know, James did an incredible GoFundMe for us when we hit a massive snag and basically needed to get an emergency roof put on the progress that we had made on the building last year before winter set in. We got the roof on. We've actually gotten the whole building sheathed and framed. And uh, my buddy Patrick is actually here this week helping me with the electrical design. And we are at this exact moment, um, well, not this exact moment, but this week, we are putting in a temporary electrical panel so that we can start stringing wires and then comes insulation. We're waiting on our um, siding stuff and then things are gonna really start to get real. I still have no idea when we're actually going to be able to open, but uh, having basically shoestringed this whole thing, um, having originally intended to have a full construction crew and everything else, just like whip it out really quickly. Uh, it's been pretty cool. I've been, I've been able to be way more involved in the building pro process than I thought that I was going to be originally. <laughs> and I'm thankful for all the things that I've learned along the way. That, uh, Some of them have been harder. Are... Yeah. <laughs> cool. Oh, okay, here's the here's the big question. This is the one that I, I'm very interested in. For those of you who know me, um, one of the big things about my channel is 
the joy of woodworking and it's the why of doing it, not just the what and the how. So I want to know, Anne, why or what is the thing that triggers you? What is the thing that really drives you on? What is the, the passion that you have in what you do? Um, there's three kind of main things, but the number one, and it's like far and away above the others, is uh, community. So my entire life, I've loved learning things that people that I care about are passionate about. So it really doesn't matter the thing. If there's someone that I care about that likes something, I will go all in just to have the chance to be there to experience their own passion and also to learn alongside them. And so woodworking became my thing when I was three years old. My grandfather was a kind of jack of all trades and he was very interested um, in like basically passing on the skills that he had in me. Unfortunately, he passed away when I was very young. And so I didn't actually have opportunity to use or like utilize or develop any of the skills he taught me until about eight years ago when I moved from Taipei, Taiwan to Seattle and had a garage and some disposable time for the first time in my life. And I got into hand tool woodworking and it was all downhill from there. Um, a mentor in the hand tool woodworking um, kind of field, his name was Frank, is Frank. He actually just had his hundredth birthday this week and he had all the time in the world to teach me and he kind of just took me under his wing as my grandpa, uh, adopted grandpa. And he taught me all kinds of things, not just about woodworking, but also about self-sufficiency and plumbing. And we built a little mini bike together and welding and like everything. I mean, the guy we met when he was 93 years old and still he was spending eight hours a day in his wood shop. He was using hand uh, homemade scaffolding to clean off his roof. It's just, he's, he's quite a guy. And, like if it was, I mean, if it wasn't woodworking, it would have been whatever else he was interested in because I was very interested in spending all my time hanging out with Frank. And so, yeah, like I said, it's just kind of all downhill from there. The other two things are that I struggled with le learning disabilities my entire life. So I am dyslexic and have lots of other stuff going on. So hands-on activities um, are basically the only way that I can learn and build confidence. And so um, woodworking really stuck with me uh, for lots of reasons, because yeah, it just was the first time that I could actually figure something out and do something mechanical. I'm also obsessed with history. So doing things like people used to do, uh, is fascinating in every regard. So that, that brings in the farming and all of the blacksmithing and everything else. But really I have been interested in lots of things and lots of people my whole life. Um, and when I was 21, I just kind of felt the, the thing that was like, Hey, you got to pick something <laughs> and, and, and get good at that and like it's okay if you do other things along the way but like there's got to be at least one through line and so i figured hey i really like hand tool woodworking and so that's what it's been does that sound familiar sarah <laughs> okay look, okay and i feel like you're the female version of james and i was really tempted to message you and be like bring adam because i want to know <laughs> if what i experience is what he experienced because you seem to be um, a collector of hobbies like james Yes. Well, it's also actually funny because even beyond the woodworking thing, I also have been working on getting my pilot's license. I'm also interested in diving. Um, there's like, yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> Check. <laughs> have, you, have you ever read a book called The Gift of Dyslexia? No, but actually that's shocking because I'm super into books about all this stuff. So I'm adding it to my list as we uh, speak. That was, that was a life altering book for me. Um, Really? Because it, it opened my eyes. The, the whole idea is that the dyslexic brain is very good with manipulating things in your hands and being yeah. able to just figure things out by touching and doing. Um, and the, the way it goes through it, that was, that was just one of those eye-opening things because I'm, I'm also very, very dyslexic. <laughs> it's also a good book for someone who lives with someone who's dyslexic. Ha! <laughs> yeah. so. There's another book that I really love that's called Range. Um, that it's by David Epstein and he talks about um, like the myth of specialty. So, you know, mm. everyone, my actual, actually my online name, Anne of All Trades, is because um, someone very influential, influential in my early life uh, who I really looked up to and cared about told me in a not so loving way, like you can't ride two horses with one tushy. 
uh and he he basically said he's like you're you're like this is if this is going to be the way that you are your whole life you're never going to be good at anything because you're a you're going to be a jack of all trades and a master of none but the funny thing about that is that actually wasn't an insult until someone used it as an insult against i think shakespeare it actually used to be uh like a longer phrase that basically says like the jack of all trades is a master of none um but I'm now publicly going to forget the rest of it. And it has something, it's basically- uh, Better to know some trades than none or something like that. Yes, yes, yeah. to, to know all to, trades- To be ba- than master none. of one than the master of none, I think is a- Yeah, 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 it's the, it, anyway, the, the full phrase and the book range by David Epstein talks about actually being a master of one skill actually really, really limits your prob- problem solving abilities. And in fact, it goes through like historically person after person after person who was like coming from one field and was able to use a completely unrelated skill to completely solve a problem in a completely unrelated field. And so basically the argument is that like the more skills you can actually build on, the more disciplines that you can work in, your your skills and your knowledge base will actually build on one another. So I chose my online name, Anne of All Trades, as kind of a... I love you, but uh, you're wrong. Uh, I'm going to be Anne of all trades and, and like a solver, solver of many problems, not just a jack of none. Very cool. So is that a couple of super chats I heard? So Alan super chatted, yes. He was participating to the Coco Fun Intern Melody Candy Fun because I said yes. in case they heard random giggles. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, my daughter here, stand up right here so people can see you. Uh, come on over here. No, right, right here. Just turn around. There you go. Wave your hand. Mm-hmm. My daughter's in here. She is interning to learn to run the cameras because I've always talked about I need someone to run cameras. So you might hear her. You can sit back down. And then <laughs> I love Annie Rock. Family element. Yes. Bring them in early. So thank you, Alan. Cool. Oh, I don't even have my mom joke set up. Uh, I think we're going to be pretty busy for him tonight. I know. But, uh, well, if there's uh, a way. I'm ready for mom jokes all day long. <laughs> oh, I oh. actually. I oh, please, no, please. Go ahead. Yes. Here, go finish what you're saying. Oh, I was just gonna say I've never even heard them called mom jokes. I just am not a dad, and I still call them dad jokes. And it the the longer the silence and the more eye rolls you get, then better the oh, joke yeah. must have been. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. No, the lives are known for mom jokes and dad jokes. There's a friendly competition between James and I as to who can tell the best jokes. So, I've heard you guys also really like puns. Yes. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> I almost wore my nope shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you ready? Yeah. You've heard this joke. But what would it, what would um, Iron Man say if he was the um, evil queen in Snow White? What? Mirror, mirror. I would the... love to answer. What? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Like, fairest iron. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, fairest. Fairest. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I said a fairest. I would have laughed harder had I any inclination about either of those storylines. Unfortunately, mm. I was not. Well, actually, fortunately, I attest many of my skills to the fact that I was not allowed to watch television as a child, so I missed out on all of that stuff. <laughs> Uh, he who laughs last usually had to have it explained. <laughs> well, it's sometimes lost in translation. <laughs> Anyways, maybe it's we can fun. blame it on on the lagging audio. There screen. we go. Any uh, questions so far? I think you guys have been catching them. Oh, everyone's been asking about the goats. Oh well. Yes, tell us about uh, furry butts. Tell us a goat. Tell us a goat. <laughs> uh, the goats. I mean. For those city folk, which, by the way, I say that lovingly because I was one until about a year and a half ago, uh, goats are not, in fact, the next step after chickens, um, (laughs) unless you would like to purchase a ticket straight to hell. They are the worst in every single regard. Unfortunately, I guess fortunately for them, they're very, very cute and somewhat endearing, I guess. But uh, yeah, wow, what a way to ruin your life. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> the goats are great. They're, they're very healthy and happy. 
Um, and in so in such are uh, each day plotting new ways to escape and chew the wires out of every trailer and tractor in sight and um, wreak every sort of mayhem they possibly can. <laughs> no milk reality, dud not i will say Christmas. milk dud is perfect in every regard she is a tiny version of the other ones and she's so entitled and such a jerk that it's actually really cute and endearing so actually milk <laughs> dud stands on a pedestal all of her own so she's great <laughs> any jokes so any questions so far any questions i think you guys okay, if you guys don't have any questions throw them in there otherwise i'm going to start uh, going through some of the other ones so let me uh, let me go through some of the basic things um what is your favorite project you've done and normally i say you know what's your favorite woodworking project but for you you you, you yeah I, I i sometimes look at your channel and think man i wish i could broaden my channel out i've kind of pigeon pigeonholed myself to hand tools only Actually, I think that you have done yourself a huge favor in that because the last year I've tried to kind of figure out like what I'm going to do with my channel because I have been doing so much for so long that um, I've built such a diverse audience that in fact, um, you know, I do a lot of business coaching like social media, uh, like this is how you start a business. This is how you utilize social media to like help your business along. And basically this last year I had to quit doing weekly videos on YouTube because I was like, as far as the value of my time goes, like making a YouTube video takes me so much time, effort, energy, and capacity. And like the, the, the return is not there. The, um, the problem is that I don't care about money at all, which makes me a, a bit of a horrible business person uh, <laughs> a lot of the time, but I love making YouTube videos. And so having to kind of take a step back away from making YouTube videos uh, this last year has been rough because it's one, like, even though it's not necessarily my most uh, like financially viable thing, it is like one of my favorite things to do. So all that said, um, <laughs> with all of, this, all of the projects that I'm doing, this was not a super popular video, but um, my neighbor, pulled an ATV out of his woods that had been sitting in his woods for six years. And he told me he'd trade me a pack of Coors Light for it. And if I could get it running, it was mine. And so he's a mechanic. Um, I also have another friend who's a mechanic who came out to like take a look at it and was like, ah, I'm not really interested in this. And anyway, I know, well, I knew nothing about like any of this stuff. I've, I've been working on restoring an old truck, but I mean, old stuff has very little electronics in it and like, it's very mechanical. So again, my dyslexic mind can kind of just like look at it and see what's wrong. Like there's very little that's invisible to the eye. Uh, the ATV, however, was a 2006 model, uh, maybe 2000, maybe 1996. Actually, I'm not even fully sure what, what year it is, but it was a, something with a six. Here's dyslexia at its finest. But anyway, I was able to, uh, over like the course of three weekends, basically tear the entire thing apart. And one day I was using a leaf blower to start a trash fire because I live in Tennessee now. And I realized, hey, like when I blow on the fire, like if there's enough fuel there, then the fire will ignite and get huge. So one of the issues that I was having with the ATV is I could get it to start, but as soon as I pushed the gas, it would just like, it would die. And so I opened it up, I looked at the carburetor and I was like pushing, anyway, this is a very long story. Basically the leaf blower helped me figure out how to fix the ATV. And the first ride that I took on that ATV, knowing that it had, it had been pulled out of the woods from sitting for six <laughs> years and like two mechanics had given up on it and that I knew nothing, like. I didn't even know how to get it out of park because I've ne I had never like ridden an ATV before. I didn't know anything about the things like, anyway, I now have a working ATV. It is the coolest thing I've ever done because like, A, I'm obsessed with things that could probably kill me. And B, it just like was so cool to like fire this thing up and like literally sit on it and ride it down the hill and just be like, this was a, <laughs> this was garbage a little while ago. And yeah, that's that. I love stuff like that. But as far as woodworking, I mean, 
chair making changed my life. Like Greg Pennington taught me how to make Windsor chairs. I've made a lot of them. I've helped him teach classes now. And I mean, that's, that's the goods as far as I'm concerned. See, I've done Windsor chairs and, uh, I, uh, no, not me. <laughs> well, it's, there's a lot of it that's like really tedious, but again, going back to like yeah. the things that I like about woodworking is that I really like sitting in a room with someone who really is passionate mm. about what they're doing. And Greg is one of my favorite people to speaking of dad jokes. He had it. The guy is a fountain of consistent dad jokes. It's just absolutely incredible. But anyway, sitting in a room with him for three or four days, it doesn't matter what we're working on. It's always fun, but it usually is Windsor chairs. And um, I think really the compound angles of the legs is, I, I was like, I'm dyslexic. I can't figure out angles. I can't do that. I had written it off, but there's something about a Windsor chair that, you know, you walk into a room and it, you're transported back 200 years and mm. what more could I want out of a piece of furniture that I build than to be like, Oh, Hey, we're in the 1800s all of a sudden. <laughs> so we're getting some questions. I see we are, but I have, okay. The nurse in me wants to know how's Josh doing? Oh, well, I uh, thank you so much for asking for those that don't know who Josh is. Uh, Josh is my business partner. He and I are launching the school of all trades together. He is 36 years old and he had a sudden massive, obviously unexpected heart attack two weeks ago. And I mean, doctors said if he'd come in five minutes later, he would have died. Um, he has a very long road to recovery ahead of him, but I was texting with him a few minutes ago, uh, right before we started this. And he's like, this is the worst vacation I've ever been on. <laughs> so at least he still has his sense of humor. Um, yeah, he's in, he's in good spirits and like, we honestly, like, I'm really thankful that he's still with us. It definitely puts like all of our plans and everything on hold indefinitely, but like, who cares about plans? I'm like, I'm just really glad my friend is still there to be a dad to his two boys who I absolutely adore and to his, and a good husband to his wife, who's one of my best friends. So yeah, we're, he's, he's, he's going to get there, but it's going to be a while. Cool. Right. Yeah. Keep us posted. That's, that was, wow, Sarah mentioned because she saw it on your Instagram first, and I was like, wow, where'd that come from? Here's a funny, not so funny side note about that, actually. So those who have never seen, Josh um, was Instagram famous long before any of us because he was doing a project called 365 Spoons where he carved a spoon every single day for a year and basically like hacked the learning process while also becoming an incredible spoon carver. But... He is known for his perfectly coiffed hair and his like very fancy mustache. And I kid you not, coming like in the hospital, his hair is perfect. His mustache is perfect. And I'm like, look, we're trying to do a GoFundMe to like raise money for you here because I know that you're you need it. And he's like looking like exactly like he always looks, like perfectly coiffed. And I'm like, hey, could you please at least try to look like a little bit more pathetic than you do. Um, but yeah, no, he like, it was, it was literally hilarious to all of us. Cause like, how is your hair? Like you're in a hospital bed. Like literally someone's like using this little balloon thing to try to explode the, the blockage in your heart. And like, you're just like sitting there serenely looking exactly like you always do. Like, how is this possible? It's very annoying. The nurse is laughing. Uh, yes, I'm just imagining this person. <laughs> oh, well, you being a nurse, you might also uh, appreciate the fact that he had to have 15 angioplasties. Holy macaroni. What is he eating? Yeah, so it, it literally, like, it is, they, the doctors, are, it's like, they're like, it, it's not diet. It's not, like, they have no idea what happened. Huh. Crazy. Yeah, it's wild. Hmm. Well, yeah, for for in... those who aren't in the know, it usually only takes one to two angioplasties yeah. to clear the blockages when you have a heart attack. 15. He ha had a record 15, um, and yeah, it was scary stuff. Huh. And still was perfectly quaffed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do we got, babe? We'll just call him the Princess Diana of Woodbury. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, I think he'll appreciate that. I'll text him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have several questions for Anne. Um, let's see. 
Sean O'Neill wants to know what is your favorite wood species? Walnut. Although it's gotten a close second with uh, white oak. And I'm actually going to just go ahead and fully say that it's white oak because I feel like walnut is such a cliche <laughs> answer. Have, have you gotten to play with live oak? Uh, yeah, it's I'm the sure worst. I'm down there you've got lots of it. Actually, thankfully, blessfully, not as much. There's a, so much in Texas. Every time I go visit uh, Jason, Big Pen, it's a disaster with the live oak. And also, I, like, because I teach a lot of spoon carving classes, like, I get so many questions from people in, in Texas and, like, other places in the South where live oak is prevalent asking about, like, how they can use it to carve spoons. And I'm like, sorry <laughs> to tell you, you cannot. I had, I had an email from a guy... Um, who is making a Windsor chair. Oh my and, God. Uh, he's like, I'm having oak. all sorts of problems with this oak. It's just, it's, it, it's having, it's going all over the place. I'm like, well, send me some pictures. And I'm looking at it. I was like, that's not white oak. I'm pretty sure that's live oak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a treasure. What a fun way to learn some new curse words. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. What's right. next? Let's see. Scott, Bar Scott Bartholomew wants to know, do you still like your mobile chicken coop you built and any changes you would make? Oh, absolutely. And yes, I do love it. Uh, the thing I love the most is actually a recent change that I made, which is an, uh, a solar powered automatic coop, coop door opener. And that has uh, bless blissfully, blessfully, blessedly, Helped me forget that I even own chickens, which is a treasure because they're the worst. <laughs> How do you forget you own chickens? I don't have to do anything anymore. I have a fully automatic self-cleaning chicken coop that just, they now exist. And I just have to move them every once in a while, which is so delightful. Because, um, yeah. I mean, what other creature in the world has a brain the size of a pea and can also burn the earth that they stand on in three days flat. It's truly incredible. <laughs> they also give us some eggs and, you know, chicken stock and stuff. So they're, they're all right. I had a friend growing up who had a, a chicken coop. And uh, he started off with a dozen chickens. And by the end of the year, he had one. Oh. And it was just one of those. The, the, most of the time, the chickens ate the other chickens. Um, and there was all sorts of other things, and it just it, maybe it, feed him more often. Well, uh, he <laughs> he clipped the beak on one, and clipped oh. it a little too far, and it started bleeding, and so it started trying to pick the blood on the ground, and then mm -hmm. others came over and started picking it, and then realized the chicken, and it was just a mess. And... <laughs> I had a chicken once named Hairless Honey that that happened to, and um, amazingly, well, this is a family channel. Never mind. You can imagine why she was called Hairless Honey. <laughs> what's next let's see Colin Steele wants to know what's the one hand tool you own that you have the most emotional attachment to mm. my grandfather's hand plane what hand plane is that oh it's actually it's a number three so it's actually not like the most useful but um, because of who my grandpa was and all the things that like he taught me both like in person and kind of retrospectively looking back on stuff. Uh, I try to use it on every single project that I do. Um, and so it, it, it has touched everything that I've touched. And yeah, it's like my one little tiny way that I could carry on his legacy. Cause like really I've always, you know, if, if time travel was a thing, I like the one person I would love to have come see like my shop and, and my school that I'm building and, and the farm that I have now is it, it's my grandpa because he lived through the Great Depression and he yeah he, he he was like he taught me you use what you've got to get what you need and that honestly has stuck with me so much through my whole life and, and influenced literally everything that I've done because we didn't grow up with I mean I didn't grow up with a lot of financial resources but I never wanted for anything because it was like I have my greatest skill in woodworking or anything else is being able to like look at a pile of wood or anything else and and, and imagine what it can be and then actually make it become that and I learned that from my grandpa and so anyway yeah it's definitely a hand plane that's a cool legacy I like that there's something fun about picking up a tool that has a history to it and you, you think about that every time you use it I, I love that 
Oh, that's why I love restoring old tools because mm. I mean, a tool that's, you know, 150 years old and well used. I mean, imagine all the hands that have touched it and like imagine all the things that it's done. Yeah, I've got one with LA carved in the handle. I have no idea who LA is, uh, but I think about him every time I use it. Do you sing? Love LA, that. LA, LA, LA. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it has a valley girl voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like totally going to flatten this piece of lead and it's going to be like sugar. <laughs> Sorry, now I got that one stuck in my head every time that. you use it. <laughs> yep, every time you use it from now on. You're going to be so flat after this. It's going to be great. You're going to be so flat. You're going to be so shiny that the sun shines right off of you. <laughs> oh, there's a good uh, April Fool's video in there somehow. <laughs> Uh, all of my tools have a personality and voiceover. <gasps> and oh, that would be a lot of fun. Oh, they do. <laughs> oh, and like you it. should. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Mel Melody's got that one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so doing one of the voices. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> all right. Let's see. Mr. Mad Fox wants to know how is your blacksmithing going? My blacksmithing is going swimmingly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I haven't turned on my forge for like five or maybe five months, which really sucks, uh, to be totally honest. I like, I love forging. I love, I mean, like I got into hand tool, hand tool woodworking and then, um, I got the opportunity to run a woodworking school that also had a blacksmithing shop. And I was like, oh my gosh, I get to take free blacksmithing classes and get to use this amazingly equipped shop. Yes, I will take the job. So, uh, <laughs> I got to spend three years basically taking a class every single week, which like was awesome. And I built a blacksmithing shop at home. Um, and I was really excited about the opportunity to make my own tools, my own hand tools. Um, in fact, here's one thing right here, a little ax. Um, but yeah, I mean, since we've moved here, I like this was the only piece of furniture that I built in 2020 uh 2021 is going a little better i've got a couple chairs under my belt and you know a couple other things but um since we moved i mean i don't have like what we're we're sitting in my office slash wood shop right now and honestly just between the, the the school building and like trying to keep my business afloat and trying to do all the other things uh you know turning a three acre farm into a 30 acre farm has been uh, pretty much all consuming. So I've I'm very, very sadly had to like put some of my endeavors aside temporarily. However, with the end nearly in sight with the school, uh, I see that changing pretty, pretty significantly. Because the thing is, I actually ha I have the ability to literally turn, I have a full blacksmithing shop set up, up at the garage of the house, but it's just literally carving out the time. No pun intended. Actually, pun is always intended. <laughs> they are here. Yeah. Now we we keep take, talking about how many times have I have I talked to you like oh yeah it looks like I'll have time to be be down at your place like three oh, or four times now. This I mean here's the thing time blindness <laughs> with people who it was people who like uh who can I, I I like infinitely ideate ideate infinitely ideate. With people who have the ability to think of a lot of ideas and who can like actually make stuff happen, everything is always possible. <laughs> and the only limiting factor is your time and your effort and your capacity. And unfortunately, those things can be real buggers sometimes. Yeah. And then you throw COVID into the mix and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> real pesky, to say the least. I could do without it and I'm pretty sure everyone else could too. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you need three little helpers, anytime, anytime. Hey, there is so much poop to scoop down here. You just send them right down. Actually, we're not that far. We're like three or four hours, eh? Uh, it's actually, well, we're Rockford, Illinois, so it would be about seven hours. Seven hours. Oh, good, good, good. So, again, time blindness serves as well. <laughs> yeah. so She's saying you can scoop the poop, Mel. Okay. I even have a special like poop a scooper. Lot, <laughs> She's not in so sure about that. In exchange for the poop scooping, you get to like snuggle up to so many fluffy tushies. 
She, there's lots of animals there, though, Melody. She said you could snuggle with. Oh, yeah. I mean, the poop is animal <laughs> poop, just to be 100% clear. Hopefully. <laughs> well, on that note, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Please, let's move on quickly. <laughs> I look, I'm the nervous. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. But anyway. <laughs> so, Conal Wright wants to know, any, adva any advice for learning to weld? Uh... Don't touch the arc. <laughs> Actually, I taught a, uh, a welding class um, when I was working at the college. Um, and that, that's that's a everyone learns differently, but the best advice is just lay beads, do it over and over yeah. and over again. Practice. Practice certainly doesn't make perfect; it makes permanent. So. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, here's my best advice is follow Weldmonger. He mm. has so much good stuff. I mean, like, literally, Jody, like, I mean, hundreds of videos. So it can be a little intimidating, actually, even going to his channel. But, yeah, start at the beginning and work your way through. But, uh, like, the danger of watching videos on the Internet is that they make what's what's, like, unfamiliar familiar. And there's a really big difference between being familiar with a concept <laughs> and actually having practiced the concept. And so what James says is right on. It's whether it's laying beads or, or practicing dovetails or anything else. It's like the more you do it, the more you understand the problems that you might face and the more opportunity you have to overcome those things and actually build a, a measurable skill. I like to say that muscle memory cannot be heard. Ha! Yeah, I love that. There's another t-shirt. You, you really need to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a super chat? It is. Donna Krieger says, because you're the best, Annie. Oh, I love it. Hi, Donna. <laughs> so let's see. Um, E.G. Blue Suede asked, Anne, what hobby haven't you tried that you would like to do? <laughs> oh, first of all, I have no hobbies. That's an insult. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I have, well, this is a funny thing about growing up poor is that uh, it's literally impossible to have hobbies because you instantly try to make everything you do a business, which then also ruins it. Uh, so there's, there's that, but things that I haven't tried, uh, well, I have tried, uh, like fiber arts. I mean, I've done some spinning and some weaving and all that stuff, but I really like, I would like to free up some time within the next couple of years to actually be able to use my alpaca fluff for good. <laughs> also. I mean, I really want to make a cheese cave and I've made hard cheeses and other things like that, like, like salamis and everything, but I really would like to have the opportunity to get into those things. But what's missing here is just, I mean, any project that I, that I want to really dive deeply into it, I have to find the right person to like kind of be my, my mentor along the way. And I haven't found a cheese making or a local cheese making or like salami or weaving mentor here. I did have those in Seattle and I have weaving and fiber arts people, other places like Kate, the modern day settler in um, Boston. So if you are interested in fiber arts, go check out Kate or homesteading or literally anything. She's the smartest person I've ever met. So she's a great fellow. Are you, are you willing to make an actual like in ground cheese cave that's earth controlled? Oh, a hundred percent. So, we have this um, really creepy basement in our house and it is so begging to have a, uh, an air conditioner with a little uh, bot on it that, you know, can just be, become a cheese slash salami cave. Now I've got two refrigerators in the other room that are each their, their own temperature and humidity. And so I do all my cheeses in there. Of course you do. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm I swear you're you. twins. I swear, I swear. Yeah, I mean, we we are. I mean, we look alike. We have the same hair. <laughs> the same beard, same hairdo. Definitely the same beard. Uh, well, this is an interesting turn. Let's talk more about that publicly and privately. I 
Uh, what have you ever made blue cheese? And do you already know that I have you should not never gotten ever into, I've don't not gotten into the mold, the, uh, the, the mold yet? So <laughs> you like a word of warning: if you ever make blue cheese in your cheese cave, you'll ruin your cave because yeah, every cheese you make then. after that will become blue. Yeah. That's actually the reason why I have two is I've got a, um, a small, like, um, what do you call it, dorm size, what, yeah. two foot by two foot. And then I've got another larger one that's like three times the size of that. And so the, uh, my original one is I was going to have the top one for blues and then the bottom one for everything else. But uh, I, I still haven't jumped into that one yet. <laughs> well, the moment that you're ready to uh, get a cool bot, you can make your cheese cave much bigger and also make salami in it. And you just need a closet and a cool bot. It's like a $500 investment. And you'll be good to go. Yeah, I Although $500 will buy a lot of cheese from the store. <laughs> so there is that. This is the thing. My cheeses have never been uh, cost effective, but they've been very tasty. Well, okay, you make a mean many of feta. them have been very tasty. Some of them, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> uh, are you into mozzarella's? Um, I've done mozzarella a few times. Um, I've got ooh, what six or seven different ones right now aging, um, and I, I like to try. I like to try something once or twice until I get it, and then I, I got, I'm, I'm done with it. I got to try something different. Sounds familiar. However, I do actually have sixty pounds of mozzarella in my freezer currently <laughs> because I had an extreme excess of goat milk this year, uh. and my mom was living with us because of the pandemic. Um, this was like the only safe place she could be. So she needed something to keep her busy because I'm an introvert. And I taught her how to make mozzarella. And then she just like literally was in there. Adam, my <laughs> husband was like, every time I go out there, it's like that Billy Madison movie. It's like, oh, your fingers hurt? Well, now your back's gonna hurt because you just pulled landscaping duty. It's like, <laughs> he's like, she's like out there day in and day out stretching the mozzarella. And I'm like, look, I didn't tell her to do that. And she chose to do it on her own. I'm just gonna be down in my office by myself for a few hours. <laughs> well, my normal is the, is the feta. <laughs> Which I'm out of. I haven't, I haven't made feta in a while. I need to do that. I know. You make yes. good feta. Dude, so you got it. The feta you gotta and the ricotta with up. the way. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. You got to level up and get a cow, though. Because this is, that <laughs> is the big... The game changer for me was having my own cow. Like, the goats are whatever. Like, they provide milk and garbage, but they also ruin your life. The cow can be contained with a single strand of wire and is so great. And, I mean so much cream so much fat so much greatness <laughs> it's a tiny tiny time investment just two to four hours per day but uh worth every worth every moment for the cheese for the sake of the cheese we got another one <laughs> we're getting a little off top well, i guess we're I off know, because we're with that's okay. and all trades they know so and. No it's topic. all trades like we this. can't well, there is no off topic that's the greatest part about it yeah <laughs> let's see Scott Bar Lula, Scott Bar Barth oh I can't say Scott we're just gonna go with Bartholomew that. thank you I can't say it today um and my wife went to a woodworking class once and asked why there were not more female instructors is there a demand for ladies focused classes taught by other ladies yeah you know what's really interesting about that is I um was a huge tomboy growing up. And also I was raised in a very supportive environment where I didn't actually think it was weird that me as a girl wanted to do all the things that all the boys were doing. Cause actually I was the only girl in my whole neighborhood. So like, it just made sense that I was doing what everyone else was doing. As it turns out, I realized as an adult that there are very, it, it's, it's actually really important for people who are nervous in any way to try a new skill, to be able to see someone who looks like them actually doing that thing. And so um, when I started teaching woodworking classes around the country, um, I started getting a lot of requests for like women's only classes. And at first I thought that was really like, like almost like anti-sexist. Um, but then I realized like, you know, for especially like, like people in my, my mom's generation and stuff, like I was having many times like classes that were like, I didn't bill it as an all women's class, but it became like only women signed up. And then the women that were in the class were like, I don't feel comfortable being in a class full of guys because like 
of the way I get treated or like whatever else. So anyway, I, I think that there is a demand for like female instructors. It's like because there are less female woodworkers because there's less representation in the field like there's you know less availability and therefore more demand for it but i think that that's changing really quickly and if we were going to tout uh the benefits of social media one of the biggest ones is Mm. like even in the eight years that i or almost nine years that i've been doing this now like when i got started it was like me and megan fitzpatrick and like a, like a handful of other girls and now like everywhere I look I see it and and that makes me so happy yeah because there's not like like there's no thing stopping except for like you know just like uh like accepted opinion there's nothing in the way of of women being able to do all this in fact like Sarah I've loved seeing you get more and more involved in the channel more involved in the shop like this is the way it should be I went from practically, I mean, like I knew a hammer, a screwdriver, <laughs> and now I know what a number four is. Yeah, she sent me a picture the other day saying, I've never heard of a scorp. Tell me more about it. Yeah. I oh, love that. Yes, we can do that. <laughs> <I> would... <laughs> my, my Instagram has slowly been taken over by woodworking. <laughs> As it should. So I like secretly hoped you were going to talk about knowing what a number two was to reference what we were talking about earlier, but oh, yeah, it's good. No, actually, with our kids, um, my two boys aren't as interested in the shop, but uh, Melody is um, very interested. She actually has her own small woodworking channel. So, I'm almost at I a love thousand. that. <laughs> what? A thousand is a l- well, lot of people. It's hard to fit a whole thousand people in a room. Six hundred now, six hundred, yeah. seven hundred, something like that. Yeah. You just got to put more out there, sis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my only gripe, Anne, and maybe you could encourage him to get these chairs done. <laughs> I build this bench, and what has it become? A lateral surface for holding things. Uh, horizontal surfaces tend to collect garbage. Yes, yes. unbelievably. It shouldn't well. be mine. Well, that should be. Here's the, here's it the should thing. be his own Once stuff. Once I get the chairs done, <laughs> which will probably be in about two or three weeks. When That's it's an cleared incredible off, trajectory. You've got two like or three a week for any project. You've got a, You've got like a week where you can claim it, but you have to get your project on there before my next project starts to spread. So. <laughs> Where's my duck? <laughs> so his his man spreading is on your workbench. Yes. Well, you got to claim your territory. Go out and pee on that bench. No, girl. I've just decided that I'm just going to start taking pictures with me using his tools, whether correctly or incorrectly, and see how long it takes to get the bench clean. Here for it. Here for it. I've been trying to convince my husband to start a channel where he just like like pretends to do all the things that I'm constantly being accused of claiming credit for like, Oh, your husband's doing all that woodworking. Like you should, uh, you should stop claiming credit for his work. And I'm like, I really want Adam to start a channel where he like a woodworking channel. It'd be so great. In fact, uh, not to promote my own channel, but pretty soon we're doing a, a farmer Adams garden tour, which is one of the funniest videos I have ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to that one. <laughs> yes. Adam, who has never, in fact, been in the garden, gives a garden <laughs> tour telling about all of the things that he's labored to create. And it was uh, amazing. He has so much good advice for burgeoning farmers out there. And uh, <laughs> yes. Looking forward to that one. <laughs> so, what's the next As am I. Let me just tell you in the chat, they're ready to get in trouble. Tell you, poor man, my eyes are on you. Um, let's see. So back to the spoon carving that we were talking about earlier. Um, Air for 13 months now is elm a good choice for spoon carving? Elm's all right. It is a little porous, but honestly, just about any wood, if it's green or freshly cut, mm. uh, is going to carve. And, like, it'll dry. I have a couple elm spoons across the room over there. It's, it tends to like, um, kind of wear a little bit. It's a little worse for the wear. Um, especially if you have a tendency to like toss your, uh, spoons in the sink and let them soak because those pores really draw in the moisture. So it, it just needs to be refinished more often. But honestly, elm, oak, like all those 
species that like a beach that have really really big pores like that they tend to pull up a lot of water and be a little unruly as far as like keeping a nice finish on them goes but they're strong straight grained woods that work well now I've got, it's green. I've got uh what six or seven spoon blanks over there of stuff that i i'll, I'll you know i'll find a a log that has freshly been cut and it's got this perfect bend and I'm like, oh yes, I'll do a spoon out of that. Or, oh, I'll make a bowl out of that. And I bring it down to the shop and I forget about it and now it's all dry and it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> now you got some great firewood. I'll just say that like, sad. so, what's that? She said that was sad, Melody. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you can turn dry wood, but honestly, it's, it's almost not worth it to carve dry wood. Yeah. Like it is way more fun to carve wet wood and it doesn't like I would choose to carve wet oak over dry cherry any day of the week mm. because uh and, and like I mean just as like a quick primer for everyone who's not asking um I try to when when I have the opportunity to get like a, a, a tree or a log that's freshly fallen I try to find like as straight of it like James just said he he likes to choose something that has a bend, and that's great after you actually know how to use that stuff. Um, but when you're first getting started, like I try to find something that is straight as an arrow that has no branches or any other kind of like visible inclusions on the outside. It needs to be about like the size of a basketball, and I want to get it in as long of a length as I can carry. But then when I go to process it, I'll take with my chainsaw or whatever, I'll take an inch off at a time from from one end. And at like, um, if you look at the end of a piece of firewood, it's like really cracked and, and crazy. Those are called, that's called radial checking. Um, but I'll cut an inch at a time behind that radial checking until I have a clean surface. And when you have a clean surface, then you know that's green. So then you take from that clean surface about like however many inches your spoon is, which for me is usually about 15 to 18 inches. I'll cut off a piece like that. I'll split the log in half then split it in quarters. And if it's a basketball size, I'll be able to get about six spoons from that. Um, but that's gonna be like, literally doesn't matter what it is. If you can get wood that's that wet, that doesn't have any radial checking at the end, uh, that's gonna be so much more delightful to carve than literally anything. Doesn't matter the species, except for possibly honey locust, which Ha like pulls some silica from the soil. So it is really hard on your tools, but I've actually even found some locust that is even fun to carve. So I, yeah. I've actually tried uh, green Ipe. Yeah. Um, and it, it did work. I was right. I was, you know, it's just, it's Ipe. <laughs> if there's still water in the, in yeah. the tree, like it's going to be better to carve. I mean, Carving dried cherry or dried walnut, which like a lot of people get started carving spoons because they're like, oh, I have all these like mm -hmm. little scraps of walnut or cherry or whatever in my in my shop. But it's a pain in the tushy and it's like not enjoyable. And honestly, when you're carving dry wood, you're having to use excessive force. And excessive force is when injuries happen, scars. both like cuts <laughs> and like also just like um, like strain injuries. And so do yourself a favor if you're gonna carve <laughs> find some wet wood even if it's bendy just like find a branch that's fallen off the tree off a tree in a storm or call your local arborist uh greenwood is gold <laughs> cool how much time we have left for one or well, two, more? two more pulled out okay um let's hit those two and call it well, yes yeah, someone's oh, oh yes super pablo chat? super chat said i'm enjoying this video thanks Hello from Argentina. Let's see. Uh, next question. Do either of you see a decline in antique tool prices in the future? Seems like prices are still pretty high. Do you want to hit that one? Go for it, man. <laughs> I, I, you get, I'm very envious, to be totally honest, of the tool swaps that you get to go to. I'm sure that there's some here. Well, but, you know. Bowling Green, Kentucky, so that's not too far in comparison, is doing the national MWTCA meet in October. Let's meet there, man. Well, I'm going to be in uh, Las Vegas at the time, so unfortunately I oh. won't be able to be there. But... <laughs> Diving? <laughs> uh, no, we're doing our family vacation for the year. So. That was, it was a joke. Uh, um, prices, <laughs> you know, 
honestly, I haven't seen that big a change. And we were, we were talking about this in one of the groups in that there is such a huge variety in like a Stanley 45. If you get a, a simple Stanley 45, it needs to be cleaned up, comes with one cutter, but it's basically just the body and the, the, the standard pieces that come on the rail. Usually that's going to sell for around 40 to 50 bucks, um, depending upon where you get it. But if you go on eBay, that very same thing is 80 to 100. And yeah. you go out west and you're going to see it in shops 150 to 200. Um, and so a lot of times you're used to looking in one area and then you look in another place and prices are very different. Um, and so I really haven't seen a huge price swing for most things. There are some things that like router planes in the last four or five years have gone through the roof. Um, but most things, there, isn't, there hasn't been that big of a, a change. It's just more where you're looking yeah. and tends to change the price rather heavily. I mean, coming from Seattle, yeah. Uh, there, like you have to think about like where has history happened. Yeah. I mean, you go to England, you can get this stuff for dirt cheap. Um, you go to the Midwest, where like you know, blue collar America, where these tools were literally used until about sixty years ago. Like everyone's grandpa yeah. had like a huge collection of these tools, but again like you're going on ebay like ebay has a huge audience i mean this is literally the difference between like shopping at a garage sale versus like shopping at an online boutique store like i can sell my spoons online for six times what i would be able to sell them for at a farmer's market because when you're looking in a local market that doesn't have a lot available um as opposed to just like getting online and uh like having literally the whole world available to bid on whatever it is you're selling like yeah. on ebay like when i got started woodworking eight years ago it was about 45 to 60 dollars for just about any stanley hand plane um that was within the year range that i was looking for now it, like like james just said it's like 100 to 150 sometimes even more um but it, you go to a swap meet in the midwest cheap 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 no, it's the, the other thing is that, uh, especially this last year, there's been a, a heavy influx of uh, hand tool woodworkers, people getting into it mm -hmm. over COVID. And um, it's actually, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the, the collectors are driving up the price. No, actually the last year and a half to two years, it's been the users that have been driving up the price online. And they, the places like eBay where everyone immediately goes, you're looking for something, that's where they go. Prices on yeah. eBay have gone up, but locally antique stores and things like that, They've been about the same. Yeah, and actually... a lot of times at, at at antique stores, like they'll sell, like they don't even they don't know what it is, but they yeah. sell it like as an item of decor or something. So I've seen yeah. like literally like transition hand planes and stuff that are literally worth fifteen or twenty dollars. I've seen them marked, especially in Seattle, for like three hundred fifty, four hundred bucks. Yeah. And like some housewife trying to decorate her house, <laughs> like will pay it and be happy to do so. And I mean, good for the antique store owner for knowing that, but like, you know, keep your eyes open. You can find those transitional yeah. plants for super cheap elsewhere. That was actually kind of one of the interesting things about the, the history of hand tools is on the East Coast, uh, when power tools came in, it was into, into general production, it was right around the time of World War II, World War I, World War II. And you saw a, a huge industrial change on the East Coast. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the hand tools and people using hand tools switched over to power tools. And a lot of that got eaten up in scrap drives. Um, and on the West Coast, it really didn't hit its swing until power tools came out. And so on the West Coast, there wasn't really a big hand tool base to begin with. It just jumped mm -hmm. off into the power tools. Whereas in the Midwest and in the the flyover states, you had a lot of farmers who couldn't afford the power tools, and so they kept using the hand tools even through um, the world wars, and so you still have this massive log of, of uh, tools available. And so it's kind of an interesting thing about seeing what brought the history in different places. Yeah. We got one more? Uh, sure, and then we're at nine o'clock. So, um, Aiden Muhammad said, question for James, can I make a turning saw from three quarter inch teak? Sure. 
<laughs> no, for those of you wanting to know the, the live we did making the, the turning saw, actually I've, I've done two different lives now making turning saws. Um, and most of those I make out of three quarter inch stock teak. Yeah, if you've got access to it, go for it. Works well. So uh, yeah, that's about it. So I, the only thing, Ann, I would want to know, because you know you and James are so similar, is I would be intrigued if we ever get the chance to hear your learning style, because um, I do more with Instagram with you. It's, <laughs> I like it, it's faster, personally. Because um, it was very interesting learning from James, because we think so differently. So it would yeah. just be intriguing, I think, <laughs> um, as he's been teaching some newer to woodworking folks as well, um, how everybody catches on. Yeah, that was so. actually very interesting when, when working with Sarah, teaching her uh, winding sticks. Oh. Um, you know, I, I, I look at winding sticks and I, I looked at them and you know, instantly knew how they, they work. You know, when it's like this, that means the board is twisted. It's just an exaggeration of it. Yeah. And uh, for me, that was very obvious and, and fairly straightforward. But then giving that information to Sarah, I probably explained it four, five, six different ways. And she, it just wasn't clicking for her um, until I explained it a slightly different way at a different time and suddenly it clicked and ah, there you go. But it was, it was very interesting learning. There are certain things that she picks up very well that were difficult for me and some things that um, I didn't really think about and are, are challenging for her. So that, that learning demographic was interesting to look through. Working with Josh, Josh is like extremely, extremely well versed in the learning process. And if I've learned anything working with Josh, it's more about the learning process and how important it is to like learn how to use physical analogies that make sense to the people that are learning from you. And so um, one of the best teachers, I mean, Greg Pennington um, taught me to make Windsor chairs and has taught me like so much else. I mean, he's a huge reason why we moved to Tennessee, but I've never met anyone who's as good at like completely disarming you as he's vetting you for how he's going to instruct you throughout the process. Because every class starts with like some questions about what you're into and like whatever else. And then he like takes that information and somehow is like, you know, as we're doing the chair, he's like, hey, you know how like when you're tuning a hand plane and like, like, and then he, and then he explains how you <laughs> figure out the rake and splay of a chair leg because of how you like turning a hand, tuning a hand plane works. Um, I've, I've never met anyone who can do that quite like him, but Josh has taught me a lot about figuring out weird physical analogies that it's like, some spoon carving things like like the 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 chest lever grip like this is really hard for people to learn until you think about like if you had a pen and a lid for a pen in your hand and you had to put the you had to take the pen lid on and off the pen without taking your hands off your chest like how would you do that things like that uh a make sense to me and also make sense to a lot of other people but like Honestly, anyone who learns anything really easily and quickly, I'm just like, you're a jerk because <laughs> I've not experienced that. I mean, some things now, like the more that I've learned how to use different tools in different disciplines, like now it's like, oh, that, like I can fix the yeah. motor in a truck with this tool, obviously, because that's how I had to tune my um, helical head on my planer. Like that stuff <laughs> has started to like make weird connections in my brain, but um like very little in my life has ever been learned easily. And so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> cool. Well, I think we've had enough for this week, mm -hmm. uh, this month, yeah. this week. But uh, we will uh, have another live. Um, it's sounding like next month is going to be uh, Shannon Rogers from the Hand Tool School. Ooh. Uh, so I've been trying to get him lined up for a little while. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been about it. Uh, next week we are doing... I don't know what we're doing next week, so stay tuned for that. I think it's just going to be an actual live where we'll talk through uh, some particular part of woodworking. So if there's something you want to see, let me know. I want to say a, a huge thank you, Anne, for coming. It has been awesome having you on here. Thanks and, so much uh, for having me, man. It's so fun to hang out with you three. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a family show. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, looking forward to uh, um, seeing where you're going and uh, looking forward to uh, watching the, 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 uh, the school come together out there. Well, come out any time. We have so much poop to scoop. Just leave that <laughs> on that note. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, then I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, right. have a wonderful day. See you later. Bye. Cheers.